Modern day clothing has come on leaps and bounds from when cycling first began. Technology and science has advanced what we wear for the better. But what are the key revolutions in cycling clothing that have changed for good? Here are our top picks. Spandex or as we cyclists like to call it, lycra, was invented in 1958. I guess Madonna kind of ruined the word spandex for her. But whatever you call it, lycra is a synthetic fibre known for its incredible elasticity and it revolutionised cycling clothing completely. Lycra just fits the bill, it's the perfect material for cycling. It's tight fitting, it's aerodynamic, it's lightweight, it's quick drying and it's strong. And due to its incredible elasticity, it returns to its original shape after being stretched. Before the world of lycra, it was a woolly place. It was the go-to material for pros, even though it was stretchy and itchy. And when it was wet, it sagged like a bag of potatoes. I am thankful for the invention of lycra, to say the least. Oh, and you can see Hank trying to ride in uh, woolen clothing right here. Another cycling clothing revolution we are all extremely grateful for is the synthetic chamois. Pre-1930s, uh, the chamois just didn't exist. You were just sat on your woolen shorts on a leather saddle and well, you just dealt with the chafing. Sounds very unpleasant. Post 1940s, chamois were made from leather. A mild improvement, I guess, and you needed a cream to help soften the leather. And the leather of choice was of course deer, a soft and supple leather, apparently. It wasn't until the 1980s that the modern day chamois became a staple for clothing manufacturers made from microfiber with a foam padding. It revolutionized comfort on the saddle. And I think our bottoms are quite grateful for the chamois. The ASOS Corona suit was the first ever skin suit to be used. And that was in 1978 at the track World Championships in Munich. It was a game changer at the time and a definite aerodynamic advantage compared to the shorts and jersey combo. Other manufacturers scrambled to copy ASOS's design and make their own version of a skin suit. It only took two years until every rider at the track World Championships in Moscow wore a skin suit. These days, skin suits are the TT garment of choice, but they have snuck in to road races, with most riders wearing them with every race they do. The speed suit is basically a skin suit, but with pockets in the back, making it easier for riders to carry gels and race food. However, it's surprising how much time it actually took to catch on. Many riders still wear shorts and jersey. I remember just a few years back, if you turned up to a race in a speed suit, everybody thought you were weird. Fashion can be stubborn sometimes. Okay, so maybe not clothing, but a clothing accessory, I guess. In the very first Tour de France, riders used glasses similar to motorbike goggles, which were used on descents and on very dusty roads. Modern day sunglasses are dramatically different. They have different shade levels, anti-UV, anti-fog, lightweight, and shatterproof. Oakley's factory pilot eye shades were the first of what can be described as the modern look of cycling sunglasses. First used in 1984, they set the tone for cycling shades in the modern era. The first real helmet was invented by Bell Auto Parts in 1975 and it revolutionised head protection. It consisted of a hard outer shell with foam-like material inside and that was the beginning of the modern helmet we see today. Before 1975, riders either didn't wear a helmet, which is something I just can't imagine, or they wore this leather sort of hat tied together with wool and they were shown to be pretty ineffective at protecting your head. And they had the tendency to rot too. 1975 can be seen as a turning point in helmet safety, but it wasn't until 2003 that helmets became mandatory in races. 
With the invention of the modern day helmet, manufacturers were trying to find ways to make them more aerodynamic. Now, vents kept the head cool, but they also created drag, which is aerodynamics' worst enemy. Greg LeMond pioneered the first ever aero time trial lid when he famously beat Laurent Pignon in the 1989 tour, taking the yellow jersey by eight seconds. LeMond used Giro's Aerohead helmet, a model which is still going today, a hard shell helmet designed to cut through the wind. It revolutionized slippery helmets and set the tone for years to come. We here at GCN are a big fan of a cap or casket and are definitely of the view that caps and not hats belong in cycling. They are just the key part of cycling culture. From the early 1800s, caps were synonymous in cycling. It was the flat cap. They used to protect riders from the elements. It wasn't until the 1950s that the cycling cap we see today became commonplace. Sponsors began branding the caps and they became the true mark of a professional cyclist. As a cheaper item of clothing, they were the perfect symbol to support a rider or a team. Gabba jackets were the brainchild of Gabrielle Rash and these came about in 2010. Until then, rain jackets were fully waterproof, but riders tend to sweat too much and overheat in them. Rush wanted a jacket that was waterproof yet breathable, keeping the rider warm but not overheating and causing them to sweat too much and then getting wet from their own sweat, going against the purpose of a waterproof jacket in the first place. Castelli partnered with Gore to develop a short sleeve jacket that kept most of the rain out but also allowed the humidity to get out. The Gabbert jacket was born and Gabrielle Rush became immortalised in cycling clothing history. The Gabba and its imitations have become a staple for pro riders, with many riders opting for the Gabba jacket in the early years. Thomas Fockler, a French rider, was rumoured buying each rider in his team a Gabba jacket, a chop price. All praise the Gabba jacket! Yes, I know it's not really clothing, but wait for my point. The M71 marked a big change in cycling and it was invented in 1971. Before Cinelli debuted their first clipless pedals, riders used to use a toe strap system without the cleats. The M71s allowed the riders to clip their shoes straight onto the pedals. From this point onwards, cycling shoes were made with this in mind. The M71s can be seen as a revolutionary year that led to the shoes we wear today. Possibly one of the best revolutions for keeping us warm, Gore-Tex. It was invented in 1969 and it changed riding in the rain. It was lightweight, breathable and waterproof. Gore-Tex is a fluoropolymer material and it repels water in drop form and it allows it to pass through as vapour, which is very good for its active cyclist. It's quite weak on its own, so it's usually mixed between two stronger materials. We see Gore-Tex on many modern cycling clothing and I personally am very grateful for it, especially on cold winter wet rides. So those were some of the key clothing revolutions in cycling, but what ones did we miss? Let us know in the comment section below or on social media. And what are your favorite clothing revolutions in cycling? It's the perfect material for cycling. It's tight fitting. The speed suit is now, speed suit. These days, skin suits are the TT garment of choice, but they have a, these days, skin suits are the time trial clothing garment. These days, these days, skis. Modern day sunglasses are dramatically different. Different shade levels, anti-UV, anti-fog lenses, lightweight and shatterproof. First worn in 1978. 1978. Oakley's factory pilot eye shades were the first of what we can describe that has set the look for the modern look. Also on the cheaper end of the clothing spectrum. 
Oh, praise the Gabba jacket.